The Look Alive podcast is sponsored by Sonic. Welcome to the Look Alive podcast. I am Alex Glaze. Can you believe in about a month from now, we're going to be at SunTrust Park and we're going to be playing meaningful baseball at Truist. I said SunTrust Park, didn't I? You did, yes. Truist Park caught myself. This is impossible. I'm starting over. Welcome to the Look Alive podcast. I am Alex Glaze. Can you believe we're this close to playing meaningful baseball. It feels like baseball season just ended. It's just, just getting started up again for the 2020 season for the Braves. A lot of excitement around this Braves team this year. We just got back from spring training a couple weeks ago, and there's a lot of buzz around this Braves team, but I think the storyline so far from spring training has been kind of what the same storyline was going into spring training. Freddie Freeman's elbow. You know, it, he, he re-aggravated that, uh, that injury that he had surgery on in the off season. His elbow flared up and a lot of Braves Twitter kind of went into a little bit of a mini panic and rightfully so. I mean, Freddie Freeman is the face of the franchise. He's one of the most important players on this Braves team and you want to see Freddie healthy. When Freddie's 100%, I mean, he's one of the best players in baseball, obviously. So uh, I think there, the level of concern was warranted, but I think we kind of, now that we're able to kind of take a step back, I think when you put it in perspective, it's a good thing that this elbow, uh, I don't want to call it an injury, but this, this incident happened when it did so early in spring training because now we get to see how the Braves are going to deal with it moving forward. You know, he just rested for a couple of days. He's back in the Braves spring training lineup and he seems like he's fine. He says he feels fine. So I could, I'm going to take him for his word and assume that everything is all right with with Freddie's elbow, but it'll be interesting to see how the Braves go about managing Freddie throughout this season, because he said that he wants to play 162 games. Uh, I don't think that's gonna happen. I think we're gonna see, kind of like in the NBA, you know how we see load management, whether you love or hate that. I think we're gonna see a little bit of load management when it comes to Freddie Freeman. He's gonna get a couple more off days than maybe we're used to seeing in years past, just to keep that elbow uh, kind of at bay and keep Freddie healthy so that we don't have a situation like last year where you get in the playoffs and then Freddie's not able to be Freddie. So that's something to keep an eye on. But the other thing too that a lot of people are paying attention to in spring training is the pitching. And if we're being honest, the pitching has not been great so far, but it always takes pitchers a little bit longer to kind of catch up when it comes to spring training and kind of get in their groove. So no need to be too concerned yet. But there are a lot of new faces, a lot of guys competing for spots, whether it's in the rotation or in the Braves bullpen. And we're going to talk to some of those guys today. We're going to hear from Felix Hernandez, a, a guy who, you know, baseball fans are very familiar with. King Felix, uh, you know, he's been around forever, was playing with the Mariners forever, signed a $1 million deal with the Braves. And we're going to see what King Felix has this year. He's competing for a spot probably in the rotation. And he's looked probably like one of the Braves better pitchers so far in spring training. We're also going to hear from Tuki Tucson. He's a guy that was up and down between Gwinnett and Atlanta last year. He's looking to take that next step this year. Maria Martin went one-on-one -on -one with Tuki and had some fun with him. So we're going to hear from him. So we're going to hear from a lot of pitchers. And then we're also going to finish things off with probably the biggest story, uh, not only in sports, but probably in news in the world as well, the, the coronavirus. We're going to hear from a medical expert and just kind of try to get a hold on this thing and figure out how this can be contained and how we see this affecting sports in the near future with the Olympics right around the corner and with a lot of major sporting events happening right now and in a couple of weeks we're gonna have the final four right here in Atlanta so obviously the coronavirus is still a really important topic to discuss so we're gonna get into all that as well but I'm gonna start with Felix Hernandez and Maria Martin went one-on-one -on -one with him down in Northport. Okay, Felix, first and foremost, you play your entire career in Seattle. This is a brand new team for you. How excited are you to be with the Braves? Well, actually, I'm really excited. I mean, I closed my charter with Seattle you know, for the last 14 years. And uh, I mean, I'm excited to be part of this team and, uh, you know, trying to compete for a, for a spot in the rotation. I mean, it's a great group of guys, great organization, and I mean, really happy to be here. What's the motivation for you right now to compete for that spot in the rotation? Me? Yeah. Just to go out there and play baseball. So that's my motivation. I mean, I love the game. I just want to play and 
like I say, if it with this new organization, I would love to be here. What do you work on in the off season, and what makes you confident in the stuff that you have right now? I'm healthy. That's, that's, I mean, that's the main thing. I'm healthy. I feel really good. My body feels really good. My shoulder, my elbow feel really good. And like I said, I'm, just, I'm ready to go. What has impressed you so far? It's only a couple of days in spring training, but you see so many guys that are young, talented, and a lot of good personalities in this clubhouse. <clears throat> well, first of all, I need to know like the names, names. of everybody. <laughs> names and everybody. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm making progress. I'm making progress. But like I say, I mean, it's been fun. Do you get a sense that this team is really hungry to win a World Series? No, we, I would love to be part of that. I would love to be part of that. I mean, I've never been in a playoff the last 40 years, and then, I mean, I had a chance to make the playoffs with these guys and to be in a World Series. It would be awesome. For you, how do you make the most of your opportunity to make a rotation spot? I don't know how, but I will. Three fish sandwiches. Have a super sonic day. Thank, Thank you. you. Is yeah. this Alaska pollock that we're eating? Yes. I know that Alaska is a very dangerous place. Why? First, the ostrich. Second, you mess with that ostrich. It's it's Alaska, not Australia. Australia. Mommy. The fish sandwich. 100% Alaska pollock topped with creamy tartar sauce on a brioche bun. Only for a limited time at Sonic. See menu for details for a limited time only at participating Sonic drive-ins. All right, thank you, Maria. Now, let's hear from a guy that we're, we, we know pretty well, Tuki Toussaint. He was up and down with the Braves last season. This year, he's looking to take that next step and not only compete maybe for a spot in the Braves bullpen, but maybe a spot in the rotation at times as well. Maria went one-on-one -on -one with him and had some fun. Okay, so Tuki, it's been a long offseason, I'm sure, for you because you're always itching to get back on the field. How did offseason go? Good. Uh, I went on vacation, first time, went to Costa Rica. Uh, I went to the Bahamas, which was like a home run derby they do out there every year. Cool. So that was pretty dope, and then just worked out. You're obviously hoping to get into the rotation at the end of spring training. What do you need to work on to be able to make that happen, do you think? Fastball command, just being able to locate my fastball, being able to throw for strikes behind the count, ahead in the count. Uh, just being able to throw all my pitches in the zone. And, do you feel really good, like you're going to be really competitive and you can compete for that rotation spot? Yeah, most definitely. What makes you so confident in that? Just all the work I put in and I'm starting to just have fun, you know what I mean? And start you put in the work to have fun. You don't work while you're having fun. So I put in a lot of work this offseason, so I'm just ready to have fun. You got a curveball in your arsenal, and I know that one time in spring training, someone very important called it <laughs> filthy. What was your reaction when you heard that? Oh, man, it was humbling. Tell everyone really. who it was. <laughs> I actually don't remember, honestly. Yes, you do. Miguel Cabrera. He said that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it was... So when you, hear, when you hear that from somebody else, that somebody's been in the big leagues for a long time and they say that your curveball is filthy? Um, it's humbling. It's humbling. Yeah. Because you just don't, as a kid, you grow up like, oh man, I can't wait to face these guys. I can't yeah. wait to face these guys. And yeah. then you get there and you face them, and it's like, like I said, I, didn't, I honestly don't remember. So, because right. it's just out there competing. Yeah. And now that you brought it up, I do remember it. And it's like, it's an honor. Yeah. Because this is the first Valley Hall of Famer. And right. he's saying, I'm filthy. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> that humble background comes from your parents. Uh, your parents. They have been in Haitian politics before. Your mom, your grandfather was in politics here, right? Kenya. Kenya. Yeah. So having that background, how does that help you here? I feel like it just slows everything else down. I mean, all the attention and all, everything everyone wants you to do, it kind of, just being around that, seeing how they manage it, you kind of feed off of that. I was young, I don't really remember much, but I remember how they went about their business and how they went about their work. And I was, biggest part like my dad always just try to have fun and I feel like over the years I kind of got away from having fun and took everything as work 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 so I kind of just went back to that just have fun be yourself don't try to be somebody else you're not yeah that's really what I've taken from that who's harder on you mom or dad I really I'm not really close to my dad but yeah. my mom yeah she'll call me like you just gave her five runs I'm like <laughs> come on mom <laughs> so she's the one that's always calling you and giving you yeah, definitely. Some hard stuff. What, what's kind of the hardest thing that she said to you? Where you were like, oh man, mom's uh, on me. I remember it's A ball and I I gave up like nine runs. Oh no. I gave him up, honestly, like 30 runs in 10 innings. 
twice against, I gave up nine runs twice against Asheville, which is Colorado Rockies. Yeah. And then I think like five or six or something against uh, Columbia, which was the Mets. And I called her at Asheville and I was like, I'm coming home. And she's like, if you come home, you're not staying in my house. And I was like, <laughs> no. all right. So you didn't stay at her house that night? No, nah, I didn't go home. You weren't allowed? <laughs> nah. <laughs> it's good that mom's hard on you, though. Yeah. All right, Tiki, obviously this team is really hungry, back-to-back -back NL East champs. Do you feel that sense in this clubhouse that you guys want to win a World Series and you want to win it now? Yeah, definitely. Like, we had a meeting and we have a lot of unfinished business. We, I mean, we keep getting to game five and we need to get over that hump. And I feel like every every year it gets that much closer. So it's, it's getting that, that itch. You, you're starting to feel it more and more that it's like, like Sinit said, at first, nobody thought we could win. Now we're expected to win. And it's more of a, a better atmosphere, just being around more competitive guys and yeah. being able to go out there and like, all right, we're going to win today. Right. You know what I mean? There's a wave of new guys, too, and a lot of young guys that are coming up in baseball that are really good. Does that bring a newfound sense of energy, you think, to the clubhouse? Yeah, definitely. I mean, they, they always say the young and the old kind of feed off each other, <laughs> yeah. and it, it's it's the truth because you see like the Acuna's, the Albies, the Andersons coming up, the Bryce Wilsons, the Kyle Wrights, myself, Free. Like we all came up together, so it's mm -hmm. like we know we're our vets, and they have the other vets, the Freddies, the Will Smiths, the O'Days, and we police each other, and they police us, and it's like they're always asking us like, hey man, what do you think about this? So it's kind of cool that we're kind of bringing a new culture, and they're. They have their staple and they ask us questions, we ask them questions. One guy that I know that you're kind of familiar with is Pat Mahomes. Yeah. Super Bowl champion. He played baseball with you? See, the thing was. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he won the Super Bowl. Yeah. And my boy tweeted at me and was like, hey, was he on our team? And I was like, was he? What? And you I don't went remember? to look. No, I don't oh, remember. No? And I saw him and I was Does like, I don't oh, remember snap. Pat Mahomes playing baseball. <laughs> I don't. Does that mean he Sorry. wasn't good? No, he was good. I, I watched his videos. Remember. Yeah, I don't remember. You just sometimes you're just so locked in, you just don't. You don't remember a lot. That means he's locked in. He doesn't remember <laughs> a lot. Okay, last thing. One of the things in the off season that you had to change was your diet. You said because yeah. too much Chick Fil A. Yep. Every day. What was the order? It was spicy chicken, no pickles, American cheese. Okay. Fries. Every day the same thing. Yeah, this was every day. Baseball players, same thing. Eight count nugget. <laughs> Bar uh, buffalo sauce and Chick-fil-A sauce. No butt fries? Yeah, 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 I mean, you get the fries and then you just pick them out. You can never have them do it special? No, nah, I Do you never, try? I never did that. You never tried? No. Nope. You just pick them out yourself? Yeah. It's dedication <laughs> to the no butt fries. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. One of the biggest stories probably in the world right now is the coronavirus and you know it's been in the news for a long time and now it's starting to creep into sports. We're seeing sporting events in Italy. They're going to not allow fans entrance into uh, games for the next month or so at, at just to kind of try to get a hold of the coronavirus and I'm not sure what it looks like in the next couple of weeks or months here in, in the U.S. when it comes to preventative measures like that but we do have events like the Final Four happening here in Atlanta in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have a lot of major events that people are going to have to figure out how they are going to deal with uh, the coronavirus. I mean, it's something that's it's not going away or doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon. So we brought in a medical expert to discuss kind of how she sees this uh, evolving over the next couple of weeks and months. The coronavirus continuing to be a global issue. There are, are a lot of angles to approach this new virus, but we want to talk about the implications to sports and the sports community. Joining us right now is Dr. Sujatha Reddy, and we have seen Italy ban spectators from sporting events for the next month, major events in the United States coming in Augusta, the Masters, Final Four here in Atlanta. How should people read this? Yeah, and that's a hard question to answer, but I think we may have to take this by a person-to-person -person basis, meaning if you have a ticket to this event, I think you're gonna have to wait till it gets closer. If the event is occurring, it's not been postponed, then maybe you think about your individual health because people may be putting themselves at risk if they attend these events. And what do I mean by that? If there's a person in the crowd sitting next to you, a row down, right. who has the coronavirus, you have a chance of catching it. So perhaps if you're a person with multiple medical conditions, maybe you think twice. If you're a healthy person, maybe it's more probable that you will be okay if you go. It's just really hard to answer that. And I think everyone has gonna have to make 
forgive the pun, a game time decision. Can stadiums do something about this? Can they limit the possibility of contact or how could they possibly do that? You know, I thought about that and perhaps instead of having seats right next to each other, we have space in between. Wow. Um, maybe you limit which concession stands, you restrict people where they can go, but that really will affect the feel of the game, so I'm not sure. I even thought to myself, could people possibly be tested for a fever as they're entering, as we're seeing when people are getting off airplanes from certain countries, but we know this virus can be transmitted before someone potentially has a fever, so that may not protect you. I think it's if you have a ticket to an event, you're going to have to make that decision. But having said that, we know the vast majority of people that contract the coronavirus will recover with no problem yeah. and only mild you know, illness. So again, for the most people, it's not going to be a serious health event. In our lifetime, there has not been anything like this. I mean, having a conversation like this seems somewhat surreal. You're right, because we didn't live through the Spanish flu where millions right. of people yeah. died. And so it, it is interesting, but I think this is a testament to how small the world is. So this evolves on a daily basis, right? I mean, you have to ultimately make a determination if the Masters is when it is and the Final Four next month. We don't know what next month looks like as opposed to what it does in early March. You're exactly right. Again, it's going to be a very fluid situation that I'm sure all the powers that be that are organizing the events are observing and watching. So you're talking about the summer games of 2020 in Tokyo, in Asia. It's hard to imagine how it does not impact these games. And again, I'm saying that early March mm -hmm. as opposed to an event that's going to happen next summer. Yeah, I'm not sure. Do you have yeah. the athletes compete without spectators? Wow. I, I don't know what, what that looks like, but it's a very hard decision to make. And again, as you mentioned, not something we've dealt with before. Yeah, it is, it is constantly moving. I mean, there's so many moving parts on this, uh, whether it's the virus itself or our reaction to it, what it means locally, nationally, globally. It's just changing day by day. It's crazy. It really is. All right, Dr. Reddy, thanks for your observations. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right, that'll do it for the Look Alive podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, if you like what you hear, you know, you can subscribe, like, uh, let us know. We'd like to hear that stuff as well. You can rate us five stars or actually yeah, just rate us five stars. Thanks. I appreciate that. So we'll be back next week with more of the, the biggest stories in sports. Thanks for listening. The Look Alive podcast is sponsored by Sonic.